Hello everyone, and welcome back to Alt-Roll's Class Breakdown series. I'm Bill, the admin and one of the instructors for Alt-Roll, and today we're going to continue our series to give a general overview of all of the classes in D&D 5th edition to help you learn about which ones you may want to try in your next D&D game. Today, we're going to examine the Paladin, Oathsworn Warriors of Good, who use the power of their promise to exact justice or vengeance upon their enemies. In Dungeons & Dragons, Paladins are warriors of righteousness and justice, who, through the power of their sacred oath, bring down destruction upon those who oppose them. From the moment they begin their oath, Paladins become wandering adventurers, traveling near and far to combat the ever-present forces of evil that plague the world. The oath they take accents their martial training to grant paladins magical powers like healing the sick and injured or smiting the wicked and undead. It's important to note here that in 5th edition, paladins are not inherently tied to gods, but are instead tied to their oath. However, paladins can still choose to devote themselves to certain gods if they wish to do so. In terms of their role in the party, the Paladin can be rather flexible, due to being both a Martial class and a Caster class. This is known as a Half Caster, so named because they gain spell slots at half the normal rate of a full caster, such as a Wizard or Sorcerer. Despite the addition of magic, Paladins are still a Martial class at heart, getting a beefy 1d10 hit dice and typically wearing heavy armor with strength-based heavy weapons to match. With these two aspects packed into one class, Paladins can be built a number of different ways, but generally tend to either be a frontline tank with a shield and support abilities, or a melee damage dealer who dishes out some of the best single target damage of all of the classes. Think of Paladins as a jack of all trades, master of none type of class that's going to be a little good at everything, but not the best of any one particular thing. To really put the Paladin's role in perspective, let's go through a quick pros and cons list that I've organized into three main points for each. Starting with the pros, the Paladin is firstly very durable. Starting off with the 1d10 hit die and chainmail as starting equipment, the Paladin makes a great tank option for the party to soak up enemy attacks. Plus, they have an inherent healing ability that they can use on themselves to stay topped up in prolonged fights. Speaking of, that leads to our second pro, which is that the Paladin has amazing melee damage. Accentuated through the use of class abilities and spells, the Paladin is a min-maxer's dream when it comes to melee damage. The flexibility of their kit and the wide variety of melee buffing spells they can use allows them to stack several different sources of damage into one attack, and at later levels can kill entire bosses in one turn if played well. As for the third and final pro, the Paladin is overall a pretty good healing option for the party. Despite not being solely dedicated to it, the Paladin has access to innate healing that isn't tied to spell slots right at level 1. While it can't compete with higher level healing spells, and requires the target to be within melee range, this ability can literally save lives in low-level campaigns. So overall, we can see that the Paladin excels at tanking, dealing melee damage, and healing for the party. However, there are some areas where the class lacks in certain aspects. The first of which being that the Paladin has terrible ranged damage. Most of the abilities that make the Paladin a great melee damage dealer are unfortunately not applicable to ranged attacks, and as such, the Paladin tends to falter when enemies go out of reach. Coupled with being more strength-based, the Paladin should not be the party's go-to marksman option. Now the second main negative of the Paladin class is that they tend to run out of resources very quickly. It's not uncommon for the average Paladin player to be halfway through their first combat encounter of the day and realize that they're already out of spells and abilities. Being a half-caster, the Paladin will not have as many spell uses as other full casting classes, and because of that, they need to learn to manage their resources wisely. 
Now this can often result in feeling like the paladin has to hold back while all the other classes get to use their fun abilities and spells. Now this also feeds into the third main negative of the paladin class, which is that they have very few base control options. While some subclasses can fix this, the paladin's base class features don't grant them a ton of control options for the battlefield. Coupled with the limited resources they have in terms of spell slots, those slots would be better used for healing or dealing damage, and someone else in the party should focus on debuffing the enemies or holding them in place. With the overview laid out and the pros and cons analyzed, now let's review the abilities and features that the base Paladin class earns as they level up. Starting at level 1, the Paladin gets the Divine Sense and Lay on Hands abilities. Divine Sense allows the Paladin to use an action to detect Celestials, Fiends, Undead, and Hallowed Grounds within 60 feet. Lay on Hands is a powerful healing ability that gives the Paladin a pool of points equal to their Paladin level times 5. As an action, the Paladin can touch a creature and restore a number of points equal to the amount remaining in the pool, or they can spend 5 points to cure the target of a disease or poison. At level 2, the Paladin gains a new fighting style, spellcasting, and the Divine Smite abilities. The fighting style options allow for greater specialization of the Paladin, but focus heavily on either increasing melee power or increasing their tanking power. Spellcasting for the Paladin is actually quite simple compared to other casters, due to the fact that they are a half-caster. The Paladin is a Charisma caster, which means that their spell attack modifier and spell save DC are both affected by their Charisma score. When gaining this feature, the Paladin starts with two first level spell slots that are regained upon a long rest. The Paladin gains second level spell slots at level 5, third level spell slots at level 9, fourth level spell slots at level 15, and fifth level spell slots at level 17. Before casting a spell, the Paladin must prepare them. They can prepare a number of spells equal to their Charisma modifier plus half their Paladin level rounded down, and the spells must be a level which the Paladin has spell slots for. Prepared spells can be changed after finishing a long rest through prayer and meditation. Divine Smite is in the same vein of spellcasting, but doesn't count as casting an actual spell. When the Paladin hits a creature with a melee attack, they can expend a spell slot to deal extra radiant damage on top of the weapon's normal damage. The extra damage is 2d8 for a first level spell slot and increases by 1d8 for every spell slot higher than first. Divine Smite also deals an extra d8 if the target is a fiend or undead. The greatest part about Divine Smite is that you can choose to use it after an attack hits, and the damage around it is dice-based. So, if the Paladin rolls a nat 20 and critically strikes, they can choose to add Divine Smite on top of the crit damage, and the dice rolled for Divine Smite get doubled as well. At level 3, the Paladin becomes immune to disease and chooses their Sacred Oath. Sacred Oaths, aka subclasses, grant the Paladin new spells and the ability to channel their divinity based on the oath taken to increase their effectiveness once per short or long rest. The Paladin gains extra oath features at levels 7, 15, and 20. At level 4, the Paladin earns their first ability score improvement. Ability score improvements add plus 2 to 1 ability score, or plus 1 to 2 ability scores, up to the soft cap of 20. Paladins gain 5 ability score increases as they level up, and if your DM is using the optional feats rule, you can forego an ability score improvement to take a feat instead. At level 5, the Paladin gets the extra attack feature, so they can attack twice instead of once every time they take the attack action. At level 6, 
The Paladin gets the Aura of Protection, which gives the Paladin or an ally within 10 feet a bonus to saving throws equal to the Paladin's Charisma modifier. At level 18, the range of this aura increases to 30 feet. At level 10, the Paladin and any creatures within 10 feet of them can no longer be frightened while the Paladin is conscious. At level 18, the range of this feature increases to 30 feet. At level 11, all of the Paladin's melee weapon attacks deal an extra 1d8 radiant damage. And finally, at level 14, the Paladin can use an action to end a spell on themselves or one willing creature they touch. They can do this a number of times equal to their Charisma modifier and regain spent uses upon long resting. With these base abilities established, we can see that the Paladin has some early healing options, good melee buffs, and some late game group bonuses through aura abilities. Next, let's look at the sacred oaths that Paladins can take at level 3 to cement their journey and dedication to their chosen cause. There are 9 oaths available at level 3, each of which grants some initial spells and 2 channel divinity options. I'm going to go through them in alphabetical order, but if you want to skip ahead to a subclass you want to know more about, you can use the timestamps in the description to skip ahead to the one that you're interested in. Oath of Conquest Paladins seek to not only establish order over the forces of evil, but to eliminate them fully, valuing strength above all else. Their tenets are to douse the flame of hope, rule with an iron fist, and strength above all. When taking this oath, the Paladin is granted the Armor of Agathus and Command Spells, and their two channel divinity options are Conquering Presence and Guided Strike. Conquering Presence allows the Paladin to force creatures of their choice within 30 feet to make a Wisdom saving throw or be frightened for up to a minute. Guided Strike allows the Paladin to add plus 10 to an attack roll, so long as it is added before the DM states whether an attack hits or misses. Further levels in this subclass grant an Aura of Conquest which halts and damages frightened enemies in its radius, a Scornful Rebuke to deal psychic damage to enemies that hit the Paladin, and eventually can become an Avatar of Conquest for one minute, resisting all damage, adding an additional attack to any attack actions made, and allowing critical strikes on a natural 19 or 20. The Oath of Conquest Paladin makes their presence known on and off the battlefield through their imposing will and indomitable spirit. While having some control options through fear, the Conquest Paladin works best when crushing their enemies with their physical might. So, if you want to be a knight tyrant that seeks to dominate their enemies so hard that the survivors never dare to rise up again, the Oath of Conquest Paladin may be for you. Oath of Devotion Paladins hold themselves to the highest standards of all that is lawful and good in the world, and expect others to do the same. Their tenets are honesty, courage, compassion, honor, and duty. When taking this oath, the Paladin gains the protection from evil and good and sanctuary spells, and their two channel divinity options are Sacred Weapon and Turn the Unholy. Sacred Weapon lets the Paladin add their Charisma modifier to attack rolls, causes their weapon to shed light, and turns the weapon magical if it wasn't already for up to one minute. Turn the Unholy lets the Paladin force fiends or undead within range to make a wisdom saving throw or become turned forcing them to move as far away as they can using the dash or dodge actions. Further levels in this subclass grant an Aura of Devotion, which protects allies from being charmed in its radius, a Purity of Spirit, which states the Paladin is always under the effect of the Protection from Evil and Good spell, and eventually can become a Holy Nimbus for one minute, shedding light, dealing radiant damage to nearby enemies, and granting advantage against saving throws from fiends and undead. Overall, Oath of Devotion Paladins specialize in protecting allies from status effects, as well as dealing status effects to enemies through their abilities and spells. While most effective against fiends and undead, they can still hold their own against a wide variety of monster types and allow for either an aggressive or defensive playstyle. 
Both of Glory Paladins seek heroism through their actions, training for their eventual moment of glory with their compatriots. Their tenets emphasize actions over words, challenges are but tests, hone the body, and discipline the soul. Taking this oath grants the Paladin the Guiding Bolt and Heroism spells, and their two channel divinity options are Peerless Athlete and Inspiring Smite. Peerless Athlete grants the Paladin advantage on strength or dexterity checks, doubles their carry capacity, and increases their jump distance by 10 feet for 10 minutes. Inspiring Smite lets the Paladin give out temporary hit points to nearby creatures after using Divine Smite. Further levels in this subclass grant the Aura of Alacrity, which increases the movement speed of the Paladin and their allies within range, the ability to buff the armor class of an ally or themselves when attacked, and attack the enemy if they miss, and eventually embody a living legend for a minute, which grants advantage on all charisma checks, automatically turns one weapon miss into a hit, and rerolls failed saving throws as a reaction. Oath of Glory Paladins specialize in buffing themselves and allies with supportive magic and abilities, while also tanking a lot through temporary hit points and buffed defenses. Because many of their abilities and spells focus on granting bonuses or advantage, Oath of Glory Paladins have a lot of usefulness both on and off the battlefield. While they still have the base damage every Paladin has, the Oath of Glory is best used for Paladin characters who want to act as the party's tank and support character. Oath of Redemption Paladins use violence as a last resort, believing that any person can be redeemed and monsters should only be slain when they endanger others. Their tenets are peace, innocence, patience, and wisdom. Taking this oath grants the Paladin the Sanctuary and Sleep spells, and their channel divinity options are Emissary of Peace and Rebuke the Violent. Emissary of Peace allows the Paladin to add plus 5 to their Persuasion as a bonus action for 10 minutes. With Rebuke the Violent, any time an attacker within 30 feet damages a creature other than the Paladin, the Paladin uses a reaction to force a Wisdom saving throw. On a fail, that creature takes damage equal to the damage they just dealt, and on a save, they take half that damage. Further levels grant the Aura of the Guardian, which allows the Paladin to take the damage others would normally take if they're within range, a Protective Spirit that regenerates health if the Paladin is below half their hit point maximum, and eventually can become an Emissary of Redemption, which gives resistance to all damage dealt by other creatures and deals radiant damage to creatures that damage the Paladin. The Oath of Redemption may be written off as a misguided warrior seeking a Redemption Arc trope, but these Paladins are some of the best tanks available. Through their spells and abilities, they retain enough control to deflect or absorb damage meant for others in the party, or even take the punishment themselves as part of their redemption. Overall, if you want a Paladin that excels at tanking not only for themselves, but for the entire party, the Oath of Redemption would be the best choice for you. Seen as Knights of the Fae, Oath of the Ancient Paladins serve the forces of light and love in the eternal battle against darkness. Their tenets are to kindle the light, shelter the light, preserve your own light, and be the light. This oath grants the Paladin the ensnaring strike and speak with animal spells, and their channel divinity options are Nature's Wrath and Turn the Faithless. Nature's Wrath lets the Paladin summon vines to ensnare and restrain an enemy within 10 feet. Turn the Faithless lets the Paladin utter ancient words that turn fey or fiends within range, forcing them to run as far as they can. Later levels grant an Aura of Warding that grants resistance to spell damage to the Paladin and nearby allies, the ability to choose to not drop to zero hit points once per long rest, and eventually the ability to become an Elder Champion, transforming for a minute to regain hit points, cast action spells as bonus actions, and gives disadvantage against saving throws to enemies within range. Now, both of the ancient paladins seek to lead by example in ousting the forces of darkness from the world, and do so very well. Their spells and abilities grant a good mix of control, offense, and defense, but can be somewhat niche depending on what type of enemies the DM is going to be throwing at them. 
Overall, the Oath of the Ancients is a fun subclass to try out, but can be very middle of the road in terms of enjoyment. Oath of the Crown Paladins serve society, defending against the barbarity that threatens to undo the progress of civilization. Their tenets are law, loyalty, courage, and responsibility. Taking this oath grants the command and compelled dual spells, and their channel divinity options are Champion Challenge and Turn the Tide. Champion Challenge lets the paladin challenge each creature of their choice within 30 feet, forcing a wisdom saving throw. If the creatures fail, they cannot willingly move away from the paladin. Turn the Tide lets the paladin heal allied creatures within 30 feet, so long as they're below half of their total hit points. Further levels grant the Paladin the ability to take damage meant for an ally if that ally is within 5 feet, permanent advantage against saving throws to avoid being stunned or paralyzed, and eventually can become an Exalted Champion for 1 hour, granting resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical means, advantage to allied death saving throws within 30 feet, and advantage to allies within 30 feet as well as the Paladin for wisdom saving throws. Overall, Oath of the Crown, while initially looking good, is essentially just a weaker version of the Oath of Redemption Paladin. The range on taking damage meant for allies is lower, it doesn't increase at higher levels, and they gain no innate regeneration like Oath of Redemption does. So, if your DM likes to force saving throws on the party a lot, this subclass might be useful, but if you want a true tank, you'd be better off playing an Oath of Redemption Paladin. Paladins who take the Oath of the Watchers guard the mortal plane against extraplanar invaders, honing their bodies and minds to face extraterrestrial horrors. Their tenets are vigilance, loyalty, and discipline. Taking this oath grants the alarm and detect magic spells, and their channel divinity options are Watcher's Will and Abjure the Extraplanar. Watcher's Will lets the Paladin grant their allies advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws for one minute. Abjure the Extra Planar lets the Paladin turn Aberrations, Celestial, Fey, or Fiends within range, forcing them to run as far as they can. Further levels grant the Aura of the Sentinel, which adds the Paladin's proficiency bonus to any allies' initiative roll so long as they're within range, a Vigilant Rebuke to deal damage to creatures that force others to make saving throws, and eventually can become a Mortal Bulwark for one minute, granting True Sight, advantage on attack rolls against Aberrations, Celestials, Elementals, Fae, or Fiends, and the ability to banish an enemy to their natural plane of existence when they are hit with an attack. The Oath of Watchers Paladin counters the widest variety of enemy types of all the Paladin subclasses, but pays for it in the raw power of their abilities. While mostly focusing on granting bonuses to allies, they tend to rely on a select few spells and base Paladin features to deal good damage to enemies. If the party will be facing extra planar foes like Mind Flayers in the campaign, an Oath of the Watchers Paladin would be a great choice, but otherwise be weak compared to the other subclass options that are available. Paladins of the Oath of Vengeance swear to punish those who commit the gravest of sins, delivering justice at the cost of their own purity. Their tenets are to fight the greater evil, no mercy for the wicked, by any means necessary, and restitution. Taking this oath grants the Paladin the Bane and Hunter's Mark spells, and their channel divinity options are Abjure Enemy and Vow of Enmity. Abjure Enemy forces a Wisdom saving throw on an enemy as an action. If they fail, they are frightened for one minute and cannot move. If they succeed, their movement speed is halved for one minute. The Vow of Enmity gives the Paladin advantage on attack rolls against a creature within 10 feet for up to a minute or until that creature dies. Further levels in this subclass grant extra movement after opportunity attacks, the ability to reaction attack enemies who try to attack while under the Vow of Enmity, and eventually can become an Avenging Angel for one minute, granting wings and a flying speed of 60 feet, as well as an aura of menace that forces wisdom saving throws on enemies within range, frightening those that fail and granting advantage for attacks against frightened enemies. 
Now, let's all be honest with ourselves for a second. If you're making an Oath of Vengeance Paladin, you're making Batman. It's okay to admit it, but it's too similar to ignore. However, even if you don't want to make Batman in Dungeons & Dragons, the Oath of Vengeance works great as a damage-dealing Paladin subclass, especially at singling out and destroying single-target foes with the Vow of Enmity ability. If you're making a Paladin focused around dealing damage, especially against single targets like bosses, the Oath of Vengeance might be for you. The Oathbreaker Paladin breaks their sacred oath to serve some evil power or darker ambition in life. As a result, the Oathbreaker has no tenets to follow. When taking this subclass, the Paladin gains the Hellish Rebuke and Inflict Wound spells, and their channel divinity options are Control Undead and Dreadful Aspect. Control Undead lets the Paladin command an undead for 24 hours if it fails a Wisdom saving throw so long as its challenge rating is lower than the Paladin's level. Dreadful Aspect frightens a number of creatures the Paladin chooses within 30 feet for one minute. Further levels in this subclass grant an Aura of Hate that grants a damage bonus to melee weapons for the Paladin, Undead, and Fiends within range, resistance to slashing, bludgeoning, and piercing damage from non-magical weapons, and eventually an Aura of Gloom that lowers the light level around the Paladin, deals psychic damage to frightened enemies in the aura, and can use the shadows created by this aura to attack a nearby creature. Now, the Oathbreaker subclass is not actually meant for players, but instead comes from the Dungeon Master's Guide as an option for DMs to use as a villain for the campaign, hence why they're so explicitly and blatantly evil. However, if a paladin willfully violates their oath and shows no sign of repentance, they may be forced to switch to the Oathbreaker subclass until they are able to atone for their sins. As a player subclass, it's rather underwhelming, as many of the abilities it grants would not really be useful to the party in a normal campaign setting. But if you're joining a specifically evil campaign, or if your DM is just a really cool person who's willing to work with you, they may be willing to hear you out about playing an Oathbreaker Paladin. However, it's not something I'd recommend to newer players since this subclass is not really going to be allowed at most gaming tables. With all the class and subclass abilities explained, let's now look at how to build a Paladin character if you want to try one for yourself. With Paladins being as versatile as they are, we can choose to focus on either dishing out melee damage, remaining a steady tank option, or trying to buff up our healing and spellcasting options. For the purposes of this example, I'm going to build a well-rounded level 1 Paladin that emphasizes melee damage and tankiness over spellcasting. For ability scores, a well-rounded Paladin should first focus on Strength as their highest ability score, to increase the attack and damage modifiers of melee weapons as well as to meet the strength requirements of heavier armors. The second highest ability score could either be Charisma to make spell and ability uses more powerful, or Constitution to give myself some extra hit points. Personally, I like to go with Constitution, since you can never have too many hit points and I can just let Charisma be my third highest ability. The rest of the ability scores can be spread out as you see fit based on skill choices and what you have available. Next up is Health. To determine my starting health as a Paladin, I would simply take 10 and add my Constitution modifier to it. Starting equipment is up next, and gives us some options to choose from. Considering I'm going for a well-rounded paladin, I'm going to choose a martial weapon and a shield to give me an extra two points to my armor class and a good weapon choice such as a longsword, battle axe, or morning star, five javelins to give me a good strength-based ranged option, a priest's pack, which gives a variety of religious equipment as well as a blanket, some rations, and a water skin, and finally, Chainmail and a Holy Symbol. The Chainmail starts me off at 16 base armor class, plus the two from my shield bringing me up to 18 armor class at level 1. The Holy Symbol acts as a spellcasting focus for Paladins, which lets me cast spells without worrying about material components so long as I hold the symbol in one of my free hands. With equipment sorted, let's dive into the abilities unlocked at level 1 next. When taking this class, 
Every Paladin starts with the Divine Sense and Lay on Hands abilities. When noting Divine Sense on my character sheet, I want to make sure to write down the range of 60 feet, the types of creatures it affects, as well as the amount of uses I have. The amount of uses is going to be 1 plus your Charisma modifier, and these uses will reset upon a long rest. So, if my Charisma modifier is plus 3, I would have 4 uses of Divine Sense per long rest. When gaining Lay on Hands, the pool of healing power is just my Paladin level multiplied by 5. So I need to make sure to note down that at level 1, I start with only 5 points to heal with. But every time I level up, this number will increase. I will also want to note the secondary ability of this, which lets me cure one disease or poison on a creature as well. Most people know about the healing, but many people can tend to forget that you can actually cure diseases and poisons with this ability. And with all the ability scores, equipment, and level 1 abilities laid out, we have a level 1 paladin ready to go. And that is everything you need to know about the Paladin in D&D. A flexible half-caster who is able to tank, support, and deal damage all in one righteous package. This class is a great choice for those who want a more flexible tank option for the party, or for people who want to dip their toes in the water with spellcasting, as the Paladin's magic never feels like it gets too overwhelming. Now, I've played several Paladins before, and I've had fun with every single one due to their sheer adaptability and how great they feel to min-max and deal massive crit damage with. But, what do you all think of the Paladin? Are they a good staple for adventuring parties, or are their abilities a bit too varied for your tastes? Let me know in the comments below, or join us over on the Altworld Discord, which is linked in the description, to discuss it with the rest of the community. While you're there, Feel free to say hi and check out our live courses that we run every week for free that cover any and everything you could possibly need to know to play D&D. If you want to help support the server and this channel, you can also check out our Ko-fi page in the description as well. We'll also be hosting another poll to vote on which class you all want to see broken down next in the Discord, so head over there and make sure to vote before the poll closes. Our last poll determined that the next class breakdown is going to be on the Druid class, so, practice your ohms and prepare to get in touch with nature next week. Thank you all so much for your time, I appreciate all of you supporting us here, and have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see all of you next time.